chapter 13, The Fight at Anvard. By about 11 o'clock, the whole company was once more on the march, riding westward with the mountains on their left. Uh, Corin and Shasta rode right at the rear with the giants immediately in front of them. <clears throat> Lucy and Edmund and Peredin were busy with their plans for the battle, and though Lucy once said, Where is his goose cap, Highness? Edmund only replied, not in the front, and that's good news enough. Leave well alone. Shasta told Corin most of his adventures and explained that he'd learned all his riding from a horse and didn't really know what to do, how to use the reins. Corin instructed him in this, beside telling him all about their secret sailing from Tashban. And where's Queen Susan? She's at Care Paravel, said Corin. She's not like Lucy, you know who's as good as a man, or at any rate as good as a boy. Queen Susan is more like an ordinary grown-up lady. She doesn't ride to wars, though she is an excellent archer. The hillside path which they were following became narrower all the time, and the drop on their right hand became steeper. At last they were going in a single file along the edge of a precipice, and Shasta shuddered to think that he'd done the same last night without knowing it. But of course, he thought, I was quite safe. That is why the lion kept on my left. He was between me and the edge all the time. Then the path went left and south away from the cliff and there were thick woods on both sides of it and they went steeply up and up uh, into, a, into the pass. There would have been a splendid view from the top if it were open ground. But among all those trees, you could see nothing. Only every now and then some huge pinnacle of rock above the treetops and an eagle or two wheeling high up in the blue air. They smell battle, said Corin, pointing at the birds. They know we're preparing a feed for them. Shasta didn't like this at all. When they crossed the neck of the pass and come a good deal lower, they reached more and more open ground. And from here, Shasta could see all Archon land, blue and hazy spread out below him, and even, he thought, a hint of the desert beyond it. But the sun, which perhaps had two hours or so to go before it set, was in his eyes, and he couldn't make things out distinctly. Here the army halted and spread out in a line, and there was a great deal of rearranging. A whole detachment of very dangerous-looking talking beasts whom Shasta had not noticed before, and who were mostly of the cat kind, leopards, panthers and the like, went padding and growling to take up their positions on the left. The giants were ordered to the right, and before going there they all took off something they'd been carrying on their backs and sat down for a moment. Then Shasta saw what they'd been carrying, and they were now putting on, were pairs of heavy, horrid, spiked boots which came up to their knees. Then they sloped their huge clubs over their shoulders and marched to their battle positions. The archers, with Queen Lucy, fell to the rear, and you could first see them bending their bows and then hear the twang, twang as they tested the strings. And wherever you looked, you could see people tightening girths, putting on helmets, drawing swords and throwing cloaks to the ground. There was hardly any talking now. It was very solemn and very dreadful. I am in for it now. I am really in for it now, thought Shasta. Then there came noises far ahead, the sound of many men shouting and a steady thud. 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 Battering ram, whispered Corin. They're battering the gate. And even Corin looked quite serious now. Why doesn't Edmund get on, he said. I can't stand this waiting about. It's chilly too. Shasta nodded, hoping he didn't look as frightened as he felt. The trumpet, at last, on the move now, now trotting the banner streaming out in the wind. They had stopped, they had topped a low ridge now, and below them the whole scene suddenly opened out. A, a little many-towered castle with its gate towards them, no moat unfortunately, but of course the gate down and the portcullis shut. Uh, <clears throat> On the walls they could see, like little white dots, the faces of the defenders. Down below, about 50 of the Calamines, dismounted, were steadily swinging a great tree trunk against the gate. 
but at once the scene changed. The main bulk of Rabadash's men had been on foot, ready to assault the gate. But now he'd seen the Narnian sweeping down from the ridge. There is no doubt these Calamines are wonderfully trained. It seemed to Shasta only a second before a whole line of the enemy were on horseback again, wheeling round to meet them, swinging towards them. And now a gallop. The ground between the two armies grew less every moment. Faster, faster, all swords out now, all shields up to the nose, all prayers said, all teeth clenched. Shasta was dreadfully frightened, but it suddenly came into his head. If you funk this, you will funk every battle in your life, now or never. But when at last the two lines met, he had very little idea of what happened. Uh, there was a dr frightful confusion and an appalling noise. His sword was knocked clean out of his hand pretty soon, and he got the reins tangled somehow, and he found himself slipping. Then a spear came straight at him, and, and as he ducked to avoid it, he rolled right off the horse, bashed his left knuckles terribly against someone else's armour, and then... But it's no use trying to describe the battle from Shasta's point of view. He understood too little of the fight, in a general way and even his own part in it. The best way I can tell you what really happened is to take you some miles away to where the hermit of the southern march sat gazing into the smooth pool beneath the spreading tree with Bree and Huin and Aravis beside him. For it was in this pool that the hermit looked when he wanted to know what was going on, the world outside the green walls of his hermitage. There, as in a mirror, he could see at certain times what was going on in the streets of cities far further south than Tashban, or what ships were putting into Redhaven in the remote Seven Isles, or what robbers or wild beasts stirred in the great western forest between Lantern Waste and Telmar. And all this day he hardly left his pool, even to eat or drink, for he knew that great events were on foot in Archenland. Aravis and the horses gazed into it too. They could see it was a magic pool. Instead of reflecting the tree and the sky, it revealed cloudy and coloured shapes, moving, always moving in its depths. But they could see nothing clearly. The hermit could, and from time to time he told them what he saw. A little while before Shasta rode into his first battle, the hermit had begun speaking like this. I see one, two, three eagles wheeling in the gap by Stormness head. Uh, one of the oldest of all the eagles. He would not be out unless battle was at hand. I see him wheel to and fro, peering down, sometimes at Anvard and, and sometimes to the east behind Stormness. Ah, I see what Rabadash and his men have been busy at all day. They have felled and lopped a great tree and they're now coming out of the woods, carrying it as a ram. They've learned something from the failure of last night's assault. He would have been wiser if he'd set his men to making ladders, but it takes too long and he's impatient. A <laughs> fool that he is. He ought to have ridden back to Tashban as soon as the first attack failed, for his whole plan depended on speed and surprise. Now they're bringing their ram into position. King's loon's men are shooting hard from the walls. Five Kellermen have fallen, but not many will. They have their shields above their heads. Rabadash is giving his orders now. With him are his most trusted lords, fierce Tarkans from the eastern provinces. I can see their faces. There's Corridin of Castle Tormot, and Azru, and Kalmash, and Ilgamath of the Twisted Lip, and a tall Tarkan with a crimson beard. By, my, by the main, my old master Anradin, said Bree. Shh, said Aravis. Now the ram has started. If I could hear as well as see, what a noise it would make. Stroke after stroke, and no gate can stand it forever. But wait. Something up by Stormness has scared the birds. They're coming out in masses. Uh, wait again. I can't see yet. Ah, now I can. The whole ridge up on the east is black with horsemen. If only the wind would catch that standard and spread it out. They're over the ridge now, whoever they are. Ah, I've seen the banner now. Narnia, Narnia, it's the Red Lion. 
They're in full career down the hill now. I can see King Edmund. There's a woman behind among the archers. Oh! What is it? asked Wynne breathlessly. All his cats are dashing out from the left of the line. Cats, said Aravis. Uh, great cats, uh, leopards and such, said the hermit impatiently. I see, I see. The cats are coming round in a circle to get at the horses of the dismounted men. A good stroke. The Calamine horses are mad with terror already. Now the cats are in among them. But Rabadash has reformed his line and has a hundred men in the saddle. They're riding to meet the Narnians. There's only a hundred yards between the two lines now. Only fifty. I, I, I can see King Edmund. I can see the Lord Peridon. There are two mere children in the Narnian line. What can the king be about to let them into battle? Only ten yards. The lines have met. The giants on the Narnian right are doing wonders, but one's down, shot through the eye, I suppose. The centre's all a muddle. I, I can see more on the left. There are those two boys again. Lion alive, one is Prince Corin. The other like him as two peas. It's your little Shasta. Corin's fighting like a man. He's killed a calamine. I can see a bit of the centre now. Uh, Rabadash and Edmund almost met then, but, but the press has separated them. What about Shasta? said Aravis. Oh, the fool, groaned the hermit. Poor, brave little fool. He knows nothing about this work. He's making no use at all of his shield. His whole side's exposed. He hasn't the faintest idea what to do with his sword. Oh, oh, he's remembered it now. He's waving it wildly, wildly about. <laughs> he's nearly cut off his own pony's head. He will in a moment if he's not careful. Oh, it's been knocked out of his hand now. It's mere murder sending a child into battle. He can't live five minutes. Duck, you fall. Oh, oh, he's down. Killed? Asked three voices breathlessly. How can I tell? said the hermit. The cats have done their work. All the riderless horses are dead or escaped now. No retreat for the Calamines on them. Now the cats are turning back into the main battle. They're leaping on the ramsmen. The ram is down. Oh, good, good. The gates are opening from the inside. There's going to be a sortie. The first three out are it's King Loon in the middle and the brothers Dar and Darin on each side of him. Behind them are Tran and Shah and Cole with his brother Colin. There are ten, twenty, nearly thirty of them out now. The Calamin line is being forced back upon them. King Edmund is dealing marvellous strokes. He's just slashed Corridan's head off. Lots of Calamines have thrown their art down their arms and are running for the woods. Those that remain are hard pressed. The giants are closing in on the right, the cats on the left, King Loon from the rear. The Calamines are in a little knot now. Fighting back to back, your Tarkins down, Brie. Loon and Azru are fighting hand to hand. And King looks like winning. The King's keeping it up. Well, ah, the King's won. Azru's down. King Edmund's down. No, 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 he's up again. He's at it with Rabadash. They're fighting in the very gate of the castle. Several Calamines have surrendered. At Darren's killed Ilgamuth. I can't see what's happened to Rabadash. I think he's dead, leaning against the castle wall, but I don't know. Chalmash and King Edmund are still fighting, but the battle is over everywhere else. Chalmash has surrendered. The battles are over. The Calamine are utterly defeated. When Shasta fell off his horse, he gave himself up for lost. But horses, even in battle, tread on human beings very much less than you would suppose. After a very horrible ten minutes or so, Shasta realised suddenly that there were no longer any horses stamping about in the immediate, in the immediate neighbourhood, and that the noise, for there were still a good many noises going on, was no longer that of a battle. He sat up and stared about him. Even he, little as he knew of battles, could see that the Archenlanders and Narnians had won. The only living Calamines he could see were prisoners. The castle gates were wide open and King Loon and King Edmund were shaking hands across the battering ram. From the circle of lords and warriors around them, there arose a sound of breathless and excited, but obviously cheerful conversation. And then suddenly it all united and swelled into a great roar of laughter. Shasta picked himself up, feeling uncommonly stiff, and ran towards the sound to see what the joke was. 
and a very curious sight met his eye. The unfortunate Rabadash appeared to be suspended from the castle walls. His feet, which were about two feet off the ground, were kicking wildly. His chain shirt was somehow hitched up so that it was horribly tight under the arms and came halfway over his face. In fact, he looked just as a man looks if you catch him in the very act of getting into a stiff shirt that is a little too small for him. As far as could be made out afterwards, and you can be sure the story was well talked about for many a day, what had happened was something like this. Early in the battle, one of the giants had made an unsuccessful stamp at Rabadash with his spiked boot. Unsuccessful because it didn't crush Rabadash, which is what the giant had intended, but not quite useless because one of the spikes tore the chain mail, just as you or I might tear an ordinary shirt. So Rabadash, by the time he encountered Edmund at the gate, had a hole in the back of his hauberk. And when Edmund pressed him back nearer and nearer to the wall, he jumped up onto a mounting block and stood there raining down blows on Edmund from above. But then, finding this position, by raising him above the heads of everyone else, had made him a mark for every arrow from the Narnian bows, he decided to jump down again. And he meant to look and sound and, and no doubt for a moment he did look and sound very grand and very dreadful as he jumped, crying, The bolt of Tash falls from above! But he had to jump sideways because the crowd in front of him left no landing place in that direction. And then, in the neatest way you could imagine or wish, the tear in the back of his halberd caught on a hook in the wall. Ages ago, this hook had had a ring in it uh, for tying horses to. And there... He found himself like a piece of washing hung up to dry with everybody laughing at him. Let me down, Edmund, howled Rabbitash. Let me down and fight me like a king and a man. Or if you're too great a coward to do that, kill me at once. Certainly began King Edmund, but King Loon interrupted. By your majesty's good leave, said King Loon to Edmund, not so. Then turning to Rabbitash, he said, your royal highness, if you'd given that challenge a week ago, I'll answer for it that there was no one in King Edmund's dominion, from the High King down to the smallest talking mouse, who would have refused it. But by attacking our castle of Anvard in a time of peace, without defiant scent, you have proved yourself no knight, but a traitor, and one rather to be whipped by the hangman than to be suffered to cross swords with any person of honour. Take him down, bind him, and carry him within till our pleasure is further known. Strong hands wrenched Rabadash's sword from him and he was carried away into the castle, shouting, threatening, cursing and even crying. For though he could have faced torture, he could not bear to be made ridiculous. In Tashban, everyone had taken him seriously. At that moment, Corin ran up to Shasta, seized his hand and started dragging him towards King Loon. Here he is, father, here he is, cried Corin. Ay, and here thou art, at last, said the king in a very gruff voice, and hast been in the battle, clean contrary to your obedience, a boy to break a father's heart. At your age, a rod to your breech were fitter than a sword in your fist, ha! But everyone, including Corin, could see the king was very proud of him. Chide him no more, sire. If it please you, said Lord Darin, his highness would not be your son if he did not inherit your conditions. It would grieve your majesty more if he had to be reproved for the opposite fault. <coughs> well, well, grumbled the king. We'll pass over it for this time. And now. Uh, what came next surprised Shasta as much as anything that had ever happened to him in his life. He found himself suddenly embraced in a bear-like hug by King Loon and kissed on both cheeks. Then the king set him down again and said, Stand together, boys, and let all the court see. Hold up your heads. Now, gentlemen, look on them both. Has any man any doubts? And Shasta could not understand why everyone stared at him and at Corin, nor what all the cheering was about.